Hi, welcome to Change Data Capture on Hadoop with SyncSort. My name is Greg Grubbs. I'm a solutions architect with SyncSort. And as promised in previous video series, I'm going to do a screencast that actually shows the development environment. So this is a technical presentation, a technical demonstration uh, of the environment that we use to develop basically traditional data warehouse types of processing to be deployed on Hadoop in the MapReduce framework. So I'll need just a few slides to start to provide some context. Firstly, SyncSort itself, the basic engine that we have is something that was originally developed for the mainframe more than 40 years ago that did sort, merge, dedupe, those types of operations on large data sets. That later got generalized over the last 10 years to doing all the types of operations on large data sets that you would expect a relational database to do, but purely on flat files. So that includes operations as copy, sort, join, merge, and aggregate. The engine is extremely efficient and extremely fast because mostly owing to its origins on the mainframe and a lot of, uh, of uh, specific algorithms and patents that have gone into it over the years. What I want to talk about though, that, that engine is now of course still used on the mainframe but also an ETL tool, but it has a very unique positioning on Hadoop and that's what I want to cover today. If you're interested in the mainframe or ETL solutions, you can visit SyncSort.com and download some white papers or uh, even contact me to, to get more details. So one of the things SyncSort has done in the last couple of years is we made a very significant contribution to Apache Hadoop. And that's purely open source. It was made to, to make the sort steps pluggable. So the, before our patch was accepted, and this is what you're probably used to in, the, in MapReduce, you would write a mapper in Java, possibly combiner and partitioner as well, and then the framework would take over and take the output from your mappers and sort, sort it. Whether you wanted to sort it or not, didn't matter, it would always have to sort it. And then the shuffle phase, which is not really shown here, would take place and those sorted chunks would go off to the various reducers. Before your reducer would see its input, it would get merged. And merge is a, a kind of a special subset of sort that re recognizes that it has pre-sorted chunks. In this case, the pre-sorted chunks are the outputs from each mapper. The sync sort contribution is beneficial not only for SyncSort but also to the general community because it allows you as the Java program programmer to override the map sort step if for instance it, as I said before your data was already sorted on the on the Hadoop key or your mapper produces sorted output or you just don't care about sort you could write for instance a pass through at the map sort step you might similarly decide to override the reduce merge because, for instance, if your Hadoop job, if you want to perform the equivalent of something like a head-10,000 and look at just the first 10,000 records that come through, you don't want the entire data set sorted just to do that. So you can override the reduce merge and just stop processing after the first 10,000 records, that type of thing. Now, of course, SyncSort, we have our own way of dealing with this step, and that is we allow you to use our graphical environment to develop data processing flows at each of these steps. There's still a, a real mapper and reducer, but we provide them out of the box. If you want to use your own, you're welcome to do that, of course. Our mapper does the equivalent of an identity mapper but it does not output key value pairs. Instead, it delivers the record as is to this first part of the, of the flow in the map sort step. So when you're dealing with it, you're not thinking in terms of keys and values, you're just thinking in terms of records, whether that's fixed length, delimited, 
some mainframe format, XML, or whatever. And then, uh, and then basically you, you keep that type of, of a paradigm, of a record paradigm going throughout the flow and you never worry about key value pairs. That's one of the little simplifications that we can uh, provide with this architecture. Now, if you want to look into the details of our contribution, then I would have you look at JIRA ticket MapReduce-2454. That's on the Apache Hadoop project. And that was our original opening JIRA ticket that says, let's, let's make the, step, the sort steps pluggable. And that eventually, through a, a long series of community interaction, got broken out into multiple JIRA tickets each of which solves one portion of the, of the problem, and some of them actually closed out one or more tickets asking for functionality that can be provided with this architecture. So the basic idea is that you are not going to code in Java. You're going to leverage skills that many IT organizations have that if they have maintained a data warehouse already, and uh, it's something that is a very simple learning curve compared to, a, you know, a whole programming language and, and programming uh, world paradigm that uh, Java has become. So the description of the problem, before we get into, the, into actually showing what it looks like, is this is it. We, we're, we are, let's say, a global financial services company. We have a huge enterprise data warehouse with a huge MPP database cluster, such as Teradata or Natiza, something like that, many nodes, and as I have seen in many, many of these large environments, that database cluster is at or near 100% capacity all the time, almost every hour of every day. Uh, so what we're going to do is we can't, we can't easily add load processing to this data warehouse and before our Hadoop alternative, the only thing we could do is write a very large check to the database vendor. So what we're trying to do is take a serialized dump of a large table. So uh, we're going to end up in a flat file format from last week, and that's what we're calling week one. And then that same table dump from this week, which we'll call week two. And our job in the change data capture process is to determine all the deltas, all the differences between those two large files so that we can generate delete, insert, and update statements for our analytics database that's somewhere else in the, in the uh, enterprise. So in other words, our analysts are wanting to do reports, but they're not putting, allowed to put a load on the EDW, nor are we going to be allowed to do that. So we're trying to offload processing. That's the basic uh, idea. So the first way we saw uh, this problem being solved was people come and say, well, let's try to do SQL on, on Hadoop. Let's use, uh, let's use Hive or let's use Pig. Pig is a procedural type of thing. It's kind of a, a nice in-between. So let's try to do that. So the first example that we actually have of this process was an attempt to do it in PIG, but that was creating too many chained MapReduce steps, and the thing was taking forever to complete. It was taking so long, it just seemed untenable. Therefore, uh, the consultant that was working on it wrote over 400 lines of Java just to support the PIG. So the PIG script ended up doing nothing but a uh, full outer join, and then all the processing to determine the deltas was being done in Java code. And this was an attempt to make the whole thing in as one single MapReduce job and to make it more performant. So this is the way we solved the problem. Uh, I'm sorry, I need to jump right into the tool instead of uh, showing slides here. <laughs> uh, so what we start with in our environment is a dead simple. I've got a mapper workflow that happens before a reducer workflow. And what do these look like? Well, if I double click on the mapper workflow, this is, by the way, the SyncSort development environment, very simple GUI environment 
for laying out uh, data processing flows. So the change data capture process is fundamentally a join problem. And in this case, it's a big join because both sides of the join are too large to fit in memory. They may be even too large to fit in local storage on any particular node. Therefore, we're going to have to do a, what's called a big side to big side join on, on MapReduce, which can only be done at the reducers. So the mappers have a very, very simple thing to do. They just have to tag which side of the join this data is supposed to be on so that when it shows up at the reducer, the reducer can figure which side of the join to put it on. So let's see how that looks. When I dig into the uh, mapper, I see some detail. And as you'll see, I mentioned that, that our engine can do the relational types of uh, operations on large data sets. So uh, a task is one of aggregate, copy, join, merge, or sort. In this case, we're doing the simplest type of task there is, which is a copy. And what we're doing is I have taken a sampling of our big files from HDFS and put them on my local workstation. So from this point on, I can develop, debug, and test the entire data flow without Hadoop in the building, without Hadoop in a VM. I can test it entirely in this environment before I ever have to schedule it and submit it on a cluster. So it's, it, it provides a lot of granularity that is very difficult to achieve within the, the native API, as you'll see. So what we start with is, I know I've got two files. I've got week one and week two. So I went and found them on my workstation, found my week one, and indicated what type of file it is. In this case, it's delimited with line feeds at the end of the, end of the records. Uh, but it might be any type of mainframe format, variable length, fixed, fixed width format, XML, etc. And then I ask the sync sort DM Express tool, this GUI environment, to help me map the layout. So I specified what the delimiter is, that the fact that there were enclosing characters, in this case quotes, double quotes, because that's a standard CSV. And then I would name my fields. Of course, ordinarily they'd be named something more interesting than, than field one, field two, field three. But the idea here is the first three fields are my primary key. So therefore, I asked DM Express to group those three fields into a grouping that I called key fields. Then the rest of the fields, and if we scroll through here, we'll see we have 154 total fields. So 151 fields are called dimension fields. And I'm treating the entire rest of the record as dimensions because in this problem, if even one character changes in any of those fields, it will generate an update to the database. So that's you know another simplifying assumption with this particular problem. At any point, uh, when I'm looking at the data and I want to know, does it look like I expect it to look? I can right mouse click, choose sample, and see the data broken up by its fields. I know I have a couple hundred thousand records here, so if I skip a ahead a few thousand, then I can see you know what those records look like further on in the file. I can kind of browse through that way. And mostly this is just a sanity check to make sure my data at each step is as I expect it to be. So as I, as I mentioned, the job of the mapper primarily is to tag the side. So I, I create an output file and I say I'm going to output join side, then my key fields, one, two, and three, then a hash of the key fields, then a hash of all the rest of the fields, and then all the rest of the fields. But you'll see I have uh, used use the expression editor to do something tricky here. That I said if my join side is left, I'm putting the old records from week one on the left side and the new ones on the right side. If the join side is left, then don't output anything. Because in this case, this would be, if, if you know ETL, this would be a slowly changing dimensions type one, type zero, rather, 
where I'm not interested in keeping history. So therefore, I never need the values from the old side, but I will need, if I have an insert or an update, I'll need the values from the new side. And uh, if I have a delete, I just need the primary key. So I never need the left side. Therefore, I, I drop it because one of the principles of Hadoop is, is minimize the amount of data you need to push through the shuffle step. So that's how you know I'm, I'm doing that on this particular thing. Now, if we look at what is join side, I've got join side, key hash, field hash. What is this? Well, I created named values. You can create named values, which are formulas that you can save and reuse in other DM Express tasks and jobs. So join side is, I've got a, a conditional statement here that says if the source name contains week two or source name contains incoming. So in other words, if the word week two is actually in the file name somewhere, then output right, else output left, where it's R and L. And then I output field one, field two, and field three for my primary keys, then the hash of the keys in case I have any use for that. In this particular instance, I don't have a use for that, so I could eliminate this bit. Uh, and then the hash of the fields, which I'm going to use uh, to compare if the record's changed. And then my if then else uh, for the left side or right side that I showed you before. So one of the beauties here is when I have my record layout of what the fields look like and so forth, and my name fields, name conditions, and all that kind of thing, any of that metadata I can reuse in other sync sort processes. And then when I go back to this uh, mapper flow, is if you'll notice, there's also a sort step afterwards. Why is that? Well, in this particular case, it's because I'm, I'm outputting a partition number. This is what you do instead of writing a Java partitioner. You do this, which is basically a simple sort task. You, give it, you define partition number, and in my case, I defined it to be uh, the, the hash modulus the number of uh, the number of reducers for that particular run. So that's a, exactly the same thing as the Hadoop framework would do for you if you specified a numeric key. However, this allows you to just take this as a template and change the definition of partition number to suit your needs if you want to do specific partitioning. And SyncSort is a super efficient partitioner, so it's a good choice to use it. And then in this case, additionally, I'm deciding that I'm going to, uh, I, I only need to sort parti by partition number, but I'm also choosing to sort uh, by the hash of the keys so that uh, that might help the uh, processing to get uh, through this shuffle step. And then that's all the mapper does. The reducer is where the interesting stuff happens in a CDC operation. Uh, because the join happens there, and all the logic really is in the join. So the first thing is that my reducer, my reduce merge task, will see a single stream of records from both sides. So its job is it's going to have to create two sides and then stream that and then stream that into the actual join. So what does the join look like? The join defines the left side and right side, and again, remember, I, I told you I could look at this data at any point in the flow and make sure that it looks like I expect it to look. So there's my key fields, my field hash, my key hash, values if I have them, etc. And then the definition of the join, you get your left side and right side, I chose my key fields, and then I told the engine that I want you to detect matched records, which are the equivalent of an inner join, unmatched from the left side, like a left outer join, unmatched from the right side, like a right outer join. So, uh, it's going to detect all of those conditions in one single pass through the data, so I don't have to write three different SQL statements or write some huge union that then uh, filters it out. So what I'm doing instead is, uh, this engine is very efficient at doing this, 
detecting all the conditions at once and then naming the conditions. So for instance, I have a condition called is update, which is if the record is joined, in other words, it's an inner match, I've got the record on both sides, and the fields hash from the left side is not equal to the fields hash from the right side. In that case, something somewhere changed and it's going to generate an update. And if you know ETL, you know this is a uh, simplistic output, but uh, for the purposes of this demonstration, uh, that's simple is good. And then I'm going to create something called CDC status, with, which is either going to be D, I, U, or NC. So it will be NC if it hasn't changed. So it'll be delete, insert, update, or not changed. In this case, per, uh, this particular uh, rev of this process, I have a filter on the output that says retain records that satisfy CDC status not equal to NC. So I am not actually outputting the unchanged records. Instead, I'm just doing the, the things that are going to generate some sort of activity back on our analytics database. And I specify what I'm going to output, so the CDC status, and then based on the uh, whether it's delete, insert, or update, I'm making decisions as simple unnamed formulas as to what there's, it's supposed to do. So in this case, let's take a look at this. If CDC status equals D, so that's my condition. In other words, if this is a delete, then output field 1 else from the left side, else output field 1 from the right side. If it's a delete, I want, it, I want the record as it is, was originally in the database to, to use those key fields. It, obviously, I could use either side, but I'm just being paranoid here, uh, to do the deletion. Uh, and then I, for, for each field that I output, I can make similar types of formulas or simply drag the, the field or value over to the output. So when we take a look at what that looks like, we'll see... Yes, I've got some inserts here uh, with all of their data. I'm just going to randomly jump, jump ahead a little bit, or a lot bit. Here's some deletes. They don't have any data uh, fields because they don't need them, just key fields uh, and that kind of thing. So I, I'm, I'm relatively sure that my output is looking good, and then I can check it on a, a much smaller data, data set to make sure it's correct as well as, uh, as well formed. So before I go to run it on Hadoop, at different steps I will have run it entirely or in pieces on my local workstation with my sample data. That's one of the great benefits of this, and, and one of the previous runs, uh, I'll take a look at that right now, you get log files that tell you exactly what happened, so my mapper, first part of the mapper, uh, looks like there's 200,000 in my sample record. There's 200,000 on each side. Uh, it processed them. Of course, that was a simple copy, so it also output 200,000. Uh, sorry, I meant to uh, continue looking through that. Then the next step is a sort, and you see what kind of resources it used, whether it had to use workspace, etc. cetera. And, uh, you know, you can go through the whole thing like that. So, when you come to, to be ready to uh, submit it to your cluster, then basically I want to show you here the, the files that I created. cdc-mapper-dxj, that's a, a job, a dxt is a task in sync sort DM express terms. And I've got everything checked into version control. It generates just very small files that then get interpreted by our run engine, which is installed on each of the data nodes. So when I go to, to submit this job to Hadoop, the framework, the, the job tracker or the resource manager, depending on whether you have you know, MapReduce version one or Yarn, will submit the job as usual. It will farm out the mappers to various data nodes uh, etc. 
Uh, but then when the map sort step kicks in and when the reduce merge step kicks in, our engine, the DM Express engine, will actually be called to do the processing, even though the framework is in control of all of the scheduling and the flow. So let's submit that to Hadoop now. Actually, I had my files up here. Yeah, so everything's checked in and up to date. So when I go to my cluster or to my edge node where I'm going to submit the job, there's my DXTs and DXJs, and I want to make sure that I'm up to date with them. I'm up to date. And then we've got this simple command called DMX run Hadoop that takes a config file that I will show you right now. My, my, what I have to define in the config file is simply, primarily, where are my files actually residing in HDFS? Because remember, when I run here, I'm not going to be using my sample data that I had on my workstation. I'm going to use some huge, enormous data that's out on HDFS. So I have to define what those paths are, and then possibly I might define things like number of reduced tasks, uh, minimum split size, things like that, all the other types of uh, parameters that you would ordinarily specify in a Hadoop job. So to run it, I say DMX run Hadoop with my particular job config file, and it will translate those file paths that I gave it into H HDFS file paths, and then continue running. And as it runs, we can go and actually watch that. One of the things I like to do is go in, this is currently running on a six node cluster configured as a five plus one. And I like to see load averages and that type of thing because when you're using DM Express to do your processing, you're going to get much more efficient usage out of the resources on your cluster. And you want to verify that and, and balance things well by, uh, by paying attention to those, those load averages. Additionally, of course, I'm using MapReduce version 1 in this case. So I go here to look at running jobs, and I can watch that job as it goes. One of the things I want to look at, you, we saw the log files in the uh, graphical environment earlier, but if we look at one of the map tasks he, that's run already and look at its log, we'll see the DM Express logs also output to standard error within the Hadoop logs. So that's how you find out what find exactly what happened with the uh, with the resources on DM Express as your job's running. And this file, these files really are large on the, this particular example that I'm running. So that I won't make you watch this whole thing to completion as the job runs. But I hope that was uh, instructive. I think we've got a really great, uh, great development environment now for Hadoop. And I did want to, as I had brought up the uh, slide uh, briefly before, I did want to actually show one result. So I had mentioned the pig and Java combination where 423 lines of Java had been written just to support the pig script to prevent it being multiple MapReduce jobs that would really take forever. In our solution, we have zero Java written, and yet when we run this, it runs five times faster than the pig java combination, and that's with a relatively small amount of data. We find as we start to scale the amount of data out, either in, in size with row width or in number of rows, we start to pull away more and more and more from the pig java combination or from pig by itself or hive by itself. So that's some of the most uh, interesting stuff because the development is, is great up front. The maintenance is much easier to do than, than maintaining separate types of separate Java for every type of job that you submit, but you've got this ongoing benefit that is probably much more significant overall for, for your organization in performance and, and resource usage as well. So 
Any questions, please uh, shoot them to me at my email uh, on the YouTube account. And that's all for now. Thanks.